This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. Hi, everyone. This is Brianna Whitney, host of True Crime Arizona, and this is an update from The Zombie Hunter. I'm here with my colleague, Morgan Lowe. He's an investigative reporter here at 3TV, CBS5, and Arizona'sFamily.com. Hi there. So we have a lot to talk about today, and a lot of that is because it's been three weeks since our last update, our last podcast, and that's because the trial was on hold for a while, not for any specific reason other than some vacations and some plans that the attorneys had, but we are back, and there are some significant developments in this case. Yeah, I I would say that the biggest development is that we have now heard Brian Miller's voice for the first time, where he's actually speaking and not just answering yes or no. Now, he did not testify in court, but prosecutors have been playing in court a recording of the interview a police detective had with Miller when he was arrested back in 2015. And we're going to play a portion of that interview for you right now. So he claims he hasn't killed anybody, but he does admit to the officer that he stabbed somebody, a woman named Celeste, when he was a teenager outside the Paradise Valley Mall. And he talks about it with the officer during this interrogation. He claims he blacked out when he did it. I've never killed anyone. You know, when I was a teenager, I stabbed that woman. Right. You know, that mom. 
haunted me for years. Is it possible that you could have blacked out and done something like that to somebody and not recall? No, because I knew I had done something when that happened. I used to remember her name, but I think the hard part for me to believe is if my semen is with someone, well, two people that are dead. Wow, that was a lot. I know that that interview is kind of hard to understand every word, but just hearing his voice and hearing that back and forth was really interesting to me. Brianna, what are some of the other things that stood out to you? So, I mean, I think his demeanor was interesting. He was very calm and he was calm talking about everything. And there was more that we learned in this interview. One of the things I found very interesting was the officer brings up his ex-wife, Amy, told them that they had bondage sex issues in terms of the fact that they would use bondage, but it would go too far, that things got violent. And Brian Miller admitted in this interrogation that he would tie her up with a rope. And there were sometimes, you know, it, it would go too far to where she would bleed because there was like a, a, a knife, some, some type of a knife involved he admitted to, to this officer. Now, his rationale was that it was completely consensual, but you still hear that. And, and she told officers this was a problem, and he's very calm about the whole thing. And so I think that's a big part of this whole violent tendencies that yeah. the prosecution is going for. And I know that they talked about this plan that he had as well, and his, his mom provided documents to the officers. Right. So the first day that they showed this video of the interrogation, uh, one of the first things the detective did was show Brian Miller this piece of paper, and he, he hands it to him, and he says, do you recognize this? And Miller takes a minute or two and, and reads it, and he says, well, no, but that looks like my handwriting. And the officer says, would it surprise you if I told you that your mother gave that to police? And what he's referring to, if you've been listening to the podcast and following the trial, is this letter that Miller had written a couple of years um, before. Well, actually, it was he, he wrote it in the early 1990s when he was still living at home. And prosecutors now call it the plan because they say that it describes this plan that Miller had to... Um, abduct some unknown 17-year-old girl, uh, torture and kill this person. Wow. And, um, and so they're using it as evidence, as premeditation, that he was planning to do this for a long time to the victims. And so it was just interesting to see prosecutors show this to him and to get his reaction. And I really think at that point, Miller realized, I'm in big trouble. I'm in trouble. He had to. I and I mean, he does vehemently deny that he had anything to do with these girls' murders, which I find interesting given the fact that we're sitting here covering a trial where the defense has already said, well, yeah, these were his actions. He did this, but he's not guilty by reason of insanity, that he was insane at the time. So, I mean, it just completely contradicts Brian sitting there over and over saying, I don't know how my semen got on these girls and I don't know how my DNA got at the scene. It beats me. Yeah, listening to him talk about that was interesting. The other thing, um, you know, prosecutors played this video, but there are some things in the video that the defense is going to use. And part of that was Miller talking about the abuse he said that he suffered at the hands of his mother. And remember in the opening statements, uh, the defense attorneys said that he was abused and that caused this mental illness that he has that, that allowed him to or caused him to do what he did to these women. And so in this part of the interrogation video, he talks about what he said his mother did to him. And, and he said that she used to beat him with a belt. And he said that it was a 10 year period from the time he was five until he was 15 
that he suffered this abuse. Uh, and he said it didn't matter if he did something right or wrong. His mother would, would beat him. And he explained to the detective when it ended. He said when he was 15 years old, his mother went to go get the belt at some point, And he stood up and he kicked a hole in the wall. And she turned around and didn't hit him with the belt, went into the room, put the belt away. And he said that was the last time he was beaten. Now, the defense is also saying that he was psychologically abused. Uh, and the part of the interview that I saw with him didn't get into that. But it does establish on the record that he claims that he was physically abused by his mom. It's part of the record. And that is going to be a big part of the defense case, which is going to start pretty soon. And I'm sure people are wondering when we say there was abuse from his mom, people are thinking, well, where was his dad in all of this? His dad died when Brian was fairly young in a motorcycle accident in yeah. Hawaii, correct? Mm -hmm. So it was really Brian and his mom for a lot of his childhood. Yeah, and that's how it came up because the detective said, you know, how was that living? He, he bounced around with a couple of relatives and then he was back with his mom and, and the detective said... How was that living or how was that? And he said, with my mom, horrible. And then he launched into this description of what he says his childhood was like. So that might have just been a little taste of more of that that we're going to hear from when the defense starts. Yeah. Now, the first day back from this big break um, was a pretty big day in court. The reason why is we heard testimony from several witnesses, but the first one was Miller's roommate from the time that Melanie Burness was murdered. So he was living with his friend, Randy, at the time that Melanie was killed in 1993. It was after Angela Brasso's death and during Melanie Burness's death. And the roommate was very, very nervous on the stand. You could tell that it almost pained him to have to talk about this time period when it was so traumatic. But he talks a lot about knives. And I want to play some of that audio for you. Do you recall at that time seeing him in possession of any knives? Occasionally, yes. Do you remember any particular knife? Um, I remember, I think you called a honey knife, and I remember a chef's knife. D describe it for me, please. Um, it's long and kind of triangular. Uh, did it ever go missing? Yes, you he said it. he had taken it to work to sharpen it. Now, it is important to note here that the defense attorney actually jumped in and made clear that that knife was back in their apartment before Melanie died. For a while, when you were listening to the prosecution, there was kind of that thought that, oh, that knife was missing when Melanie died. But the defense attorney made it clear, no, it was back in time. But Randy and Brian did talk about Melanie Burness's murder and Randy almost joked with him about it because he knew Brian was out riding his bike that night. I was kind of more like joking, saying, you, weren't you out there that night? And that night that happened, and, and his response was that he was already on, riding on the east side of town that night. His bike. Yes. When I was listening to the roommate's testimony, I think the, the part that really stuck out to me is what he said about something that he knew Brian had in his possession. It was in their apartment. Um, he saw a picture in the newspaper that popped up involving Melanie's death, and he told the judge and the prosecutor and the defense attorney that it immediately caught his attention. It was a turquoise bodysuit. Why does it look familiar to you? I had seen it earlier amongst his possessions. So that bodysuit, that turquoise bodysuit, is what Melanie Burness was found in when she was found in the canal dead. And it, for the first time, really puts something that a roommate claims he definitely saw in their house prior to the murder than at the crime scene. And that's the first time we've ever heard anything like that before, um, that outside of just the DNA, another thing that happened to be in Brian's house, according to the roommate. Right, in Brian's house, then on the victim, and um, none of the people who knew the victim identified that as something that Melanie Burness had. And um, we have heard testimony and we've read police reports that state that the 
that bodysuit, that turquoise suit did not fit. Like it was like a child size? Yeah, it was way too small. So the belief is that that is something that the killer put on the victim. And I mean, now you have the roommate saying, yeah, I saw that in his belongings before. That's that's pretty telling. Um, Another thing that the roommate testified about was the two of them would watch a lot of movies together. That's pretty normal, but he said they'd watch comedies, cartoons, maybe action movies. But he very specifically testified to a list of movie titles that he found in Brian's backpack or bag. And the reason why the roommate found it so odd is he said it was a bunch of titles of slasher movies. And we know, obviously, Brian likes that kind of steampunk, fanfare, fantastical world. That's why he created his zombie hunter character. But it did kind of go to the point that maybe there was a side of him he was hiding. Like his roommate and great friend who did watch movies with him had no idea that Brian had any sort of interest in these violent slasher movies and that he took note of that at the time. Yeah, and to sort of expand on how good of friends they were, the roommate was asked in court on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being least, 10 being best friend, where do you put your relationship with Brian Miller at the time? And he said it was a 10. That's how close he felt to Miller. And you can hear it in his voice. He's so soft-spoken, and you said he Mm -hmm. he was really nervous. I mean, this guy viewed Miller as his best friend back then. And I can only imagine how hard it was to testify. And even listening to that interrogation video from 2015, Brian tells the officer, yeah, me and Randy are still really good friends. And we're talking about they were living together in 93 and he was arrested in 2015. So not only just best friends at the time, but for a long amount of time too. Yeah. Interesting stuff there. So we'll pivot here because we also heard from two retired police officers over the past week. First, the one who questioned Miller in that police interview room. And then we also heard from an officer who transported Miller to a juvenile detention facility back in 1989 after he stabbed that woman, Celeste, in the parking lot of the Paradise Valley Mall. That was three years before the first canal murder. And I want to play a clip from this part of the trial. The prosecutor is questioning that now retired police officer, his name is Oliver Peltier, about the conversation he had with Miller that day while they were in the police cruiser. So during that time period, did you ask him why he had done what he did? I did. And what did he tell you? Initially said, I don't know. Okay. And did you say something in response? I, I said, you, if somebody does something like what he did, I said, it's normally for a reason. And I asked him if it excited him sexually. And he says, no, but I am seeing a doctor for a sexual problem. Did you give him an example of why he, a person might have done it, like for a thrill or something like that? After my initial question to him, I asked him uh, if he did to see what it felt like. And Brian said, I guess that's why I did it. Did you ask him uh, what it made him feel? Yes, I did. I said, uh, I said, what did, I said, what did, how how did it make you feel? And uh, Brian said it sent chills up his spine. That's all the questions I have. It sent chills up his spine. That sent chills up my spine when I heard that. And and I think that's about as close as we've gotten to what maybe a motive would have been like or would have been in this case because, you know, he says... Um, the police officer says, you know, most people do this because they want to know what it felt like. And he says, yeah, I guess I did it, you know, because I wanted to know what it felt like. He was sort of taking that lead from the police officer's question there. Mm -hmm. But here he tells the police officer it sent chills up his spine and prosecutors are trying to make the case that he was sort of compulsive, that he did this because he wanted the feeling that he got. Like the thrill of 
what that made him feel like internally. Right. And that's different from what the defense is saying, which is he didn't have control. He blacked out. This is, you know, this is different from that. And that's the case the prosecutors are trying to make. Yeah. I mean, over and over, we know the defense is trying to go for insanity. And very clearly, that means he did not know what he did was wrong. So when you're answering a question like that, oh, it sent chills down my spine. He knew what he was doing, at least when he was stabbing Celeste. So what does that mean? Right. And and one of the other parts of that interview, that officer talks about Miller ditching the clothes he was wearing when he stabbed Celeste. And, you know, he pleaded guilty or he was convicted of stabbing Celeste. We mm-hmm. know he did it. He ditched his clothes. You ditch your clothes because you know you did something wrong and you don't want to be caught. He ditched the clothes and then he described his feeling when he did it. That is very damning testimony here, even though... It is not about the murders that are at issue. It just sort of blows up this defense idea that we've been talking about. And it's going to have to come down to the, to the judge, maybe looking at it as, is this a, a pattern? You know, does he do this as a pattern because he enjoys it? He's already done it once. He knew it was wrong then. How is the defense going to say in three years from, from then that, oh, well, now he doesn't know it was wrong? I mean, that's a hard defense to prove. So there's a lot there. Now, the other officer who testified is William Shira. He was the detective who interviewed Miller in that interrogation video you heard. And here's a pretty blunt exchange between the prosecutor and Shira about Miller's reaction to some of the questions Shira had for him that day back in 2015. Did he have any explanation for you why his DNA and or semen was on and in Ms. Burness and Ms. Brasso? Uh, he could not explain that. Did you ask him if it was possible that he could have blacked out, uh, killed them, and just not recall it? I did. And what was his response? I don't remember exactly, but it was something to the effect of that he did not. That exchange stood out to me because that's another point where, you know, Miller's in there, he's talking to the police, he's got an idea why he was arrested. But that's where he learns that they have DNA. And when the prosecutor says, you know, did he have any explanation for how his DNA or semen was on or in the victims, he knows they have a real case. And this is just interesting listening to the detective give his version of sort of what we saw and heard on video. Yeah. You know, what I find interesting about this is that he knows they have a case and over and over and over they ask him, well, how do you explain how your semen and DNA got there? And he just keeps saying, I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you. I can't explain. He never gives any sort of reason why or how else his DNA could have gotten there. And it's clear he he doesn't know. I mean, he has no other answer for why it's there. And when it comes to a case like this, DNA is pretty foolproof. I mean, it matched him perfectly. There's nobody else's DNA this could have been. Right. They had one of the DNA experts testifying this week. And the number of um, people out there or the chances that this could be somebody else's DNA was one in like, hundreds of quintillion and a quintillion is got 16 zeros so i don't think there have been that many people ever on the earth yeah i don't think so these numbers that the combination here um that it might be somebody else if you believe that dna science and it is accepted in court um is astronomically not in Brian Miller's favor. Not at all. And so I think you have him denying, but he can't deny that his DNA is there. He never came up with another story or reason, though, as to how or why it got there. Not once in that entire interrogation. So there's been no explanation from him. And I just don't think he he has one. Right. Just need to point out here, that video is a two-hour interrogation video. That is the only time that he spoke to police about this case. It was that two hours, and then he lawyered up afterwards. So 
it is kind of interesting that we have this two hours because oftentimes they, you know, say, I don't want to talk right away. But in this case, we do have two hours that sort of give us an idea of what he was like. And even though he doesn't really answer a lot of these questions, we are able to glean some information about, you know, what his mannerisms are, how he speaks, how he reacts to these questions. Um, and it does fill in a little bit of the picture that we haven't seen yet. We've heard everybody else talk about him. We've never heard Brian Miller talk about himself. And all we've known, too, is the man behind the the zombie hunter costume and this bizarre kind of strange outfit and character he's created. And then knowing that he was um, accused of killing these girls, it was kind of eerie to put a voice with the face that we've seen for years now, not knowing what he sounded like, what his demeanor was like, anything like that. So, so I just, I just found that whole video very interesting because it's the first time we ever really know who the zombie hunter is. Yeah. And it's not always what they say. It's sort of what they look like and it's grainy surveillance video, but it is still the first time we've seen him do anything like that and seen video. And, um, there's a lot of value. To watching that. And there's a chance he may testify in this trial? It hasn't been completely ruled out. Um, you know, you talk to the, the other witnesses, some of the other TV producers who are there, and they say that, you know, it's it's not a big chance because he that, that just doesn't happen in most of these murder trials, but it's not completely ruled out. The defense is supposed to begin its case this week, so we're going to get much uh, a much better idea, one, of their strategy, but two, of what the schedule is going to be like for the rest of this trial. Prosecution, pretty much done. Now it's the defense's turn. And we think this is going to be lengthy because I, I heard them talk about it uh, in trial the day that the roommate testified. They're expecting their last witness to take the stand around December 5th or 6th. So, I mean, we're just starting in November. There's a lot to come in this trial and we will be breaking it down as it continues. So that's it for this episode. And we'll see you next week as we continue to unfold the Zombie Hunter trial. True Crime Arizona, the podcast is hosted by me, Brianna Whitney. And me, Morgan Lowe. It is a production of 3TV, CBS5 and azfamily.com in Phoenix, Arizona. This is True Crime Arizona, an Arizona's Family Originals podcast. 